Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our reading this morning comes from Genesis 19. It says, The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who you have not who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you, and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-laws, daughters, Sons, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot escape to the hills, lest lest disaster take over me and I die. Behold, the city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zor. The sun had risen on the earth when the lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Now Lot went up out of Zor and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zor. For he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. 
So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go and, and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name ben -Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Yeah, go ahead and take your seats. Thank you, Michelle. That was a very long reading. Uh, welcome, if I've been before, my name's Josh, the pastor here at Praxis. Um, we, we just chip through books of the Bible, kind of go line by line, chapter by chapter through them. And from time to time, this takes place where the Lord just sort of lines things up in a special way. And um, I, I say all that because we didn't plan to be talking about Sodom and Gomorrah in the middle of Pride Week. If you were yesterday, the Pride Parade taking place downtown, uh, we didn't plan to be preaching this text this weekend. It's just how it worked out. Um, it is a tough text. There's lots here. Um, I preached long in the first, because, and, and, and I didn't even cover half of what we could get out of this. This is, I just want to acknowledge, a, a challenging piece of text. For some, this is an uncomfortable section of Scripture. The story is maybe confusing, raises a ton of questions, might be a little hard to understand, and there's a couple reasons for that. The first is that this text depicts the judgment of God, and up in the lead up to this in Genesis, we've been reading and seeing the description of what it looks like to be within the blessing of covenant relationship with God, all of those things. Now, chapter 19 is going to outline and, and depict for us what it looks like to be outside of the covenant relationship with the Lord. And, and it, there's a contrast. This looks different. It's difficult. But it's also difficult because of its discussion about homosexuality. It, um, it doesn't speak of this topic in a way that syncopates with the messaging of our culture. In fact, the, in the midst of a time where the things this text speaks about are actually celebrated, many would wish that this chunk of text and, and the topics that, the way it addresses them could just be removed from the Bible altogether. And some in kind of the left-leaning, liberal, woke end of the church are doing just that, reinterpreting these texts, looking at them in different ways, trying to make the message of it go away. I want to make the argument here, though, that this text is in the Bible on purpose. It's been preserved here, put here on purpose, and it might be exceptionally offensive in the midst of our current cultural moment, but the truth of this story has challenged every culture up until this point. It's been a challenging read always, yet God chose to include it in the Bible. So the question we're just going to get at is why? What's it here for? It doesn't just address homosexuality either, to be clear. It, it speaks to sexuality in general. It speaks about our choices and their consequences. It teaches us about how we should engage with the culture around us. Perhaps most importantly, it, uh, it doesn't just speak about God pouring his wrath out. It also talks about God saving. It's, 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 it's a really heavy section of text, um, but it's a good one. And so I want to invite you, grab your Bibles if you haven't already, open it up. Genesis 19. You're going to need your Bible. If you don't have one, we've got some at the back. Blue one's there. That's our gift to you. If you don't own one, or you could Google Genesis 19 and follow along as well. But they've got a big section of text. I'm going to bounce around a whole bunch. Um, let me pray, and then I'll, I'll jump in. Father, I thank you that you're the God who, who spoke these words. And we, we, I just acknowledge right now that there is... There is forces at work already ahead of this. We, your word says that there is principalities and, and powers that be over this world that oppose you, oppose your, your created order. And so acknowledge that this isn't just an unpacking of ideas that is kind of doing a battle in our minds, but there is a spiritual battle going on over this place in our world at this moment. And I thank you because you, you have given us this assurance that Darkness will not overtake the light. 
Lies will not overcome the truth. And so we pray as we dig into your word that the truth contained in it would come and unpack itself in our mind, our hearts. We long to see your kingdom come more in this world. And so through this text, I ask Holy Spirit for your empowerment to unpack and present what I think is clearly contained here. And and I ask for that in the great name of Christ. Amen. All right, if you were with us last week, we've been on a journey through Genesis and... uh, Chapter 18, we saw the appearance of three men, maybe three angels. I made the argument, I think it might have been an early appearance of the Trinity. If you missed that, you can go back and take a listen. Um, But they show up and um, warn that they're going to come and judge Sodom, that Sodom's going to be judged. And first thing that we saw in Genesis 18 is that Abram was interceding on their behalf. And that's important as we go on to read this story about God's judgment on Sodom. Abe's not cheering them on. He's interceding. And so the heart of this is to to show us with compassion a a God who, yes, comes and destroys, but also seeks to come and save. And um, so it's just important to note as we go into this. And last week in in chapter, chapter 18, verse 20, there was a line that we glanced over that I suspect probably came up in some of our community groups last week. Um, that maybe didn't sync with the greater message that we were talking about. Last week, we talked about how God's all-knowing. He knows everything. Nothing's hidden from him. And yet, in, in, in verse 20, we saw this line. The same God who could hear um, Sarah's inner dialogue and read her thoughts said this. The Lord said to him, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, because the outcry is great and their sin is grave, I'm going to go down and see whether they've done all together according to the outcry that's come to me. And this is, this is interesting. A couple things worth noting in this text. First, it says a cry has come up against the city. So their sin is great. It says this cry has come up. What is the cry? I think perhaps this is the prayers of Lot. Lot, later on, we're going to see um, a few scriptures that point to this, but I got one up on the screen. Second Peter describes him this way, um, as God rescuing righteous Lot, who was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them, the citizens of Sodom, day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So he's tormented by the wickedness he sees around. Possibly it's his prayers coming before the Lord. Possibly it's the the prayers or, or, or words of others who've come and interacted with this city, perhaps it's just their sins themselves that have risen up to heaven, but it says that an outcry has come. Second thing worth noting in this text is this God who knew Sarah's thoughts, you know, if he's all-knowing, why does it say he's going down to see if it's true? You know, I'll go down and see whether they've done according to the outcry that's come to me. Isn't he all-knowing? Yes. Yes, he is, but there's something worth noting here. He's not going down to discover whether, you know, there is in fact truth to the claims because he doesn't know. He he does know, but like a good earthly judge, he doesn't pronounce judgment without being present. He kind of sets a precedent for all law that a person gets a hearing. They go down. And so he's not going because he doesn't know what's actually happening. He has to double check the reports that he's heard. He's coming down as a judge to to hear the case, as it were. And and Abe recognized this last week, and that's why Abe kind of comes as a a defense lawyer. And he comes and he says, what if there's 50? What if there's 45? What if there's 30? All the way down to 10. Remember that? So God's come down to, to preside over a legal trial, as it were. And it's this legal trial um, that we drop into as the angels come into the city of Sodom in verse 1. And so it says this, the two angels who were men, I would argue second and third members of the Trinity, but you can land where you want. These two come to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside, or turn, uh, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night Wash your feet, then you may rise up early and go on your way. But they said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. So what I want us to notice in this opening line is these angels come into town and Abe is sitting in the town square. And there's something important communicated by where he was. This this town town gate, this this place where Lot is, it is 
uh, the place where the elders would gather, where ideas would be discussed, where subjects would be dis, you know, debated, where judgments would be cast. And, and this is where they find Lot, which tells us something. Lot, Lot being present here, he, it's communicating he's part of this city. He's immersed into the culture of this city. Earlier on in, in chapter 13, you'll remember after God rescued Abe, or, and Lot from these foreign kings they were in battle with. Or, that Lot is described as living in a tent outside of Sodom. Now he's bought into the real estate market and he's moved into town. He has a house. He's been absorbed into the city and become a citizen. That's what's being communicated by him being sitting at the gate. But there's something else that we learn about Lot here is that he's hospitable. So he, these, these two People come into town, and he invites them into his house. This was a, a cultural custom to welcome people in. And as visitors come to town, um, you would you'd welcome them in. But these two visitors, they come into town knowing the wickedness that's there. They say, no, 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 we're not going in anywhere. We're staying in the town square. Except Lot pushes in verse 3, and, and, and it says he, he pressed them strongly. So eventually they gave in, and they came and stay in his house. They go inside, they, they have a feast, but then something happens after dinner. Verse 4, it says this, Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. They called to Lot and said, Where are the men who came with you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. ESV, uh, the translation we're reading from, it says, Everyone down to the last man. Um, the NIV says, all the men from every part of the city, the idea being communicated here is everyone's in on this. So as the trial begins, Abe is pleaded, if there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 10, here we see everyone. So the trial begins and ends pretty quickly here. The town forms a giant mob, surrounds Lot's house, and, and it, this part of the story I think is quite frightening. I find it a little frightening, just this visual, people piled in around this door trying to break in. Anyone ever been attacked by a mob before? No? Okay, I, I got a story then. I, uh, I, I was in Copenhagen one time, and, and I saw these, this group of kids circle around another kid and just start beating him down in this circle, they're stomping on him. And so I, I broke into the circle and started to push kids back to rescue this one kid. And um, the rest of the kids start to fight me and people start to come out of the homes. There's this, this kind of apartment blocks with courtyards between. People start to come out of the homes and attack me because I've intervened in this youth justice system that's going on. And so pretty soon I'm being chased down the road in Copenhagen on my bicycle by this mob, and I outrun them because I'm very fast on a bike. But it was a frightening moment. I remember getting back to my room and telling my buddy, like, hey, I just, and he's like, what? That's crazy. Maybe, maybe here is an example. Anyone here in the 2011 riots in Vancouver? No one, you guys, one? Who? None? Okay. Did somebody put their hand up? People are pointing. I want to hear the story. Okay, one? Okay, none. <laughs> All right. Well, I was down there too, and uh, right in the middle, watching the hockey game, suddenly a riot breaks out. People start throwing fences through the banks, all of this stuff going on. And you know there's like this mob mentality, or maybe you've heard of it. It's true. Suddenly just people are piling on, and, and everyone who's just watching the game all of a sudden is like knocking over lamp posts, lighting cop cars on fire. It got crazy really quick. This is sort of what's going on here. This mob turns. They're focused in on Lot's door, and, and it's a frightening visual, very frightening. And they come to the door, and they yell out, where are the men who came with you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. They're here. They're, they're not looking, this line, know them, to have some sort of like meet and greet handshake. What this means is they've come to become carnally acquainted with them. That's what it means in the Hebrew, to know. They want to have homosexual relations with these visitors, quite frankly. That is the classic understanding. That's what the text says. But there is some new opinions coming up around what the sin of Sodom actually was. There's always kind of 
people looking at things in new ways, but I, I, I'm going to bring these up and I want to address these different opinions for a few different reasons. I want us to know how people are arguing against this and I want us as a, as a church, as a people, to be able to defend against some of the arguments that are coming up. Just forewarning, we got this on the front end, there's some colorful language, don't say it to be crass, we're trying to be accurate. So the very first kind of thought that you come across where people would argue the sin of Sodom here isn't homosexuality. What they say is it's actually inhospitality. So Sodom, the Sodomites, um, they, you know, they, what's going on is that they were failing to be hospitable to these visitors that came to town. So chapter 18, we saw Lot being, or Abraham being hospitable. Chapter 19, we see Lot being hospitable. But what's being contrasted, they would say, is the fact that the, the citizens weren't. They weren't. This, however, I think is an argument from silence because the text here, not once does it speak negatively about the fact the men don't invite them in, or the, the citizens of Sodom don't invite these men in. Instead, it speaks negatively about the fact that they called them to come out of Abe's house because they said they actually want to know them sexually. And, and if the argument is, hey, they want to know them like they want to become hospitable, well, then isn't them, you know, if this is in reference to wanting to have a conversation, then when Lot offers his daughters up, which is another egg we'll crack in a minute, so just hold on to that. When he offers his um, daughters up saying they've never known a man, is he saying they've never had a conversation with a man? No. The argue, what no means is to sexually, carnally know. And so this argument breaks down. There's no way from this text you can land here. So then some would say this, is that the issue isn't their homosexual activity in itself. The issue is, is that they're, they're trying to engage in homosexual rape. Some modernly, they'd argue, um, yeah, again, this isn't, it's not their orientation or the way that they engage in sex. The fact they're trying to break the door down and literally just take these two men. Some combine these two ideas and say, well, you know, this is actually something people would do and that is the ought the opposite of hospitality it would be the, the number one thing that you could do to kind of disgrace somebody would be to rape them and it would disgrace them publicly. So it's both inhospitality as well as rape. But Lot doesn't allude to this. He says, do nothing to them. He's, in, a, in a sense, he actually does allude to this inhospitality part because he says, hey, they've come under the cover of my roof, which is I'm saying, you know, don't come in here. This is adhering to a kind of a cultural hospitality code. But no way is this text alluding to the fact that this is those two things. It's very clearly speaking about the sexual activity itself. Um, these new ideas come along from time to time about all sorts of different topics. They come up and they've continued to come up throughout history. Um, these two arguments here, this inhospitality and rape, these are new ideas like a couple decades old. And I think that as Christians, we need to be on guard against new ideas. Not because new ideas can't be true, but we need to look at them with a certain filter of suspicion. You know, if, if no one in 2,000 years has thought this before, how did you suddenly come across this new idea? There's a level of chronological snobbery that you have to have when you go, hey, 2,000 years in the future, I finally figured out what none of the great minds before have come up with. So generally speaking, I think it's, it's best to actually read the ancients, read the old authors, read people whose ideas have stood the test of time, because anyone can write a book. I mean, you probably all, you should have got a book on your way in. We made a book, but it was a lot harder to produce books 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years, even 100 years ago, getting a book was pretty hard. And if a book is still around 1,500 years later, it's probably because the ideas in it were found sound. We don't know with many of the modern authors whether or not those ideas are going to stick around it at all. And in fact, many of the ideas that they levy and they bring, um, they're not new at all. They're actually ancient thoughts that were refuted, and we would know that if, in fact, we read some of these ancient authors. So the, 
the text does not seem to be pointing towards the sin of Sodom being inhospitality, inhospitality or rape. It seems to be pointing towards it being sexual, um, homosexuality itself. It makes very clear um, the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to perform homosexual acts on what they thought were two men. And I say um, it's clearly homosexuality because the entomology of this word sodomize, the description of homosexual sex, finds its, um, its root and its origin in this city, Sodom. The entirety of scripture supports this as well. I've got a scripture up on the screen, Ezekiel 16, which describes Sodom and Gomorrah. It says this, this was the guilt of Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but they didn't aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. So, God does here mention their inhospitality. They, they didn't aid the poor and needy. But we see more there as well. They're described as haughty and having done an abomination before God. And that word abomination is actually a reference back to Leviticus, which you can see here. It says there, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. That's what's being referred to. The sin God is judging Sodom and Gomorrah for is this abominable act, homosexuality. And this has been the clear understanding throughout history. Philo of Alexander, who was around at the time of Jesus, he referred to the actions of the Sodomites as for, um, pardon me, forbidden forms of intercourse. Um, Augustine of Hippo, who was around a few hundred years later after that, he describes God destroying Sodom for the lewdness, lewd acts between males, quoting him. It's worth noting, though, there are several sins at play here. If you look up at that Ezekiel verse, there's many sins going on alongside this because sins are rarely in isolation. They usually kind of link together with other sins. When one sin is harbored, it brings into the harbor many other sins alongside it. So there's, there's many sins listed in Ezekiel 16, gluttony, greed, but the one that is the capstone of them all here, this abominable act, is their sexual devi deviancy. I say that because you don't end up in these outward displays without an inward, other inward things going on first. The fruits that we see are usually a result of the, the roots. It tells us in Ezekiel, the root of this is that she had pride. Look at, she and her daughters had pride because you can't get to this level of external perversion without having first become internally proud. Some incredibly insightful um, words from C.S. Lewis here up on the screen, the quote machine. He said this, the essential vice the, the utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It's through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It's, it's this complete anti-God state of mind. It's pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. One commentator I read this week, he put it this way, pride is a fountain of many sins because it's effectively saying, I want what I want and I will have it regardless of what God says or the cost to someone else because I'm better than they are and I deserve it. That's basically the message of our culture right now, isn't it? That's what determines right and wrong today. Do you want it? Will it bring you joy? Well, then it's right. That's, that's what our culture is saying. And it's pointing out the root of this is Pride, likewise, the root of homosexuality, and, and to be fair, any other sexual sin is the idea that we know better than God. When we disobey God's clearly revealed will from his word on sexuality, on anything, we are proudly rebelling and claiming that we know better. And God has clearly, in his text, revealed what sex and sexuality are for, what they're to be like. He's clearly laid this out. If you go, or if you were with us earlier on in our Genesis series, Genesis 1, it says that God created us male and female. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 28, 
he, or pardon me, in Genesis 2, he, he commands um, the man and the woman to come together, saying the man should hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. This is the description of marriage, to become one. And it's through this union that we fulfill what God created us for, which is the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying. God clearly, in Genesis, revealed his design and intent for sex. The scriptures clearly teach there are two genders, man and woman, and the scriptures say that his design is for men and women to marry and become one flesh, meaning they are to sexually engage with one another in the context of heterosexual marriage for the purpose of multiplying. This is what sex is for, according to the Bible. And when we act out our sexuality in a way that violates God's revealed will, that is called pride. It's our arrogant pride saying we will do whatever we want. Now, I said at the beginning, we didn't plan on preaching this text in the middle of Pride Month, but it is. It's, it's Pride Month. Yesterday was the Pride Parade downtown. A month-long celebration of things that deviate from God's revealed design and intent, where we literally wave other symbols that God made in his face in arrogant pride while defying what he has defined sex for. And this is an ancient idea. This isn't new. Actually, like in doing away with God in this, it's not that it's become a godless activity. If you, if you take a look, anciently there was another god named Ishtar who was able to convert people from male to female. And every June, there would be a month-long celebration and those who worshipped Ishtar would have colorful parades. And I'm not making it up. You can go look it up. This is not a godless activity. This is an ancient demonic activity that is countering what God has laid out. What we are seeing is not new. It's ancient. It's just repeating itself over and over and over. The Sodomites here don't care what God wants, which is evidenced by the fact that Lot comes and calls it wicked. And that word wicked in Hebrew means just that. Wicked, wrong. In fact, it means to break and to shatter because this is what's taking place. In defying God's created ordinance, they're coming and breaking and shattering the design that God had made, purposefully destroying it. If you're with us earlier in the series, we saw this is Satan's MO. This is what he always does. He comes and tries to undo God's created order and break and destroy it. So early on, Genesis 2, we walked through this. God spoke a good world into existence. He created man as his image bearers. He made us men and women. We walked with God. We were in a garden. We were to expand it. It was to multiply. But then you'll remember in Genesis 3, Satan comes along and seeks to demonically undo the order that God had created. He comes, and instead of going to the man who was created first, he goes to the woman who was created second to undo the created order. He comes and he questions God, the goodness of God's creation, and says, God's, not, God's actually holding you back from something good. He's not giving you goodness. He's holding you back from something better. The same lies that are being pitched to us on all fronts today. Instead of them walking with God, he undoes it, and they, they run away from God. Where the garden flourished and expanded, we'll see post-fall, actually the weeds are creeping in and choking it out. And instead of being fruitful and multiplying... Cain kills his brother Abel, and we see decrease. What we're seeing here in Genesis 19 is just a continuance of the same thing, a new demonic plan to call into question the design that God put into order. God said men and women are to be together. He sold the lie to the Sodomites that no men can be together, two women can be together, whatever it is. The Bible says there's two genders God made, but our culture here, it says now, there is an increasingly long line of genders. You can be any gender. You can make up a gender. Because we weren't made by God. We're evolving, and therefore our genders are evolving as well. And we're finding more and more genders all the time. That, that list of names and letters is getting longer and longer by the day. We need to see this is a demonic attack on God's created order, and God as well. We are created in his image, and any attack on the image bearers is an attack on the one whose image we were made in, God himself. The Bible says sex is between man and a woman, but we want to see it today, and 
you know, we see it today, and we, we see it all the way back to Sodom and Gomorrah, this push against that, the lie of Satan selling that says it can be between whoever you want. But we need to see his intent in that is to tear down God's created design. Satan wants to normalize what is contrary to God's design. Satan wants to normalize what's contrary to God's design. But I, I want you to hear this. It isn't just homosexuality that's a proud form of sexual rebellion. You can't practice any sexual activity outside of God's design without becoming proud. When we make our feelings and our desires the arbiter of truth, we make ourselves the sovereign and we say, I'll decide what I do with my body and who I'll sleep with. I'll be my own God. I don't need your created order. I know what's best. We need to know the Bible is against all sex that deviates from God's design and order. And author Sam Alberry, he wrote a book called Is God Anti-Gay? He's a same-sex attracted man who um, loves the Lord. He's actually a pastor in the States. He wrote this book. I've got it linked. We'll have some information on that at the back end. We've got it linked up on our website. But he said this. He said, no one is straight sexually. No one is straight sexually, meaning this, that no one by nature honors Lord the Lord with their sexuality. It's something we have to choose to do. We're all sexual deviants. And so this isn't damning one person. This is, a, this is a message that lumps us all in together. The Bible cuts everyone equally. Ignoring God's design for sex is sin. Ignoring God's design for sex, sleeping with whoever you want, inside, outside of marriage. You know, this is... Sin, whether they're same sex or opposite sex, if we're not obeying God in this, it's sin nonetheless, and it's proud. And when we become disciples of Jesus, the call is for us to relinquish our desires and not, not be slaves to our desires, but instead to become slaves to him. New Testament calls us to no longer be slaves to sin, slaves to our desires, instead to obey him. This is... Therefore, a call to all disciples of Jesus. God has designed his creation on purpose. We need to see this. His design for sexuality isn't because he's trying to hold out goodness from us. He actually designed it. He designed sex. And he knows how it works best. He's actually, when we honor God and sex the way he designed, there's actually more pleasure there. There's studies that show this. People who um, engage in sex within a monotonous or a monogamous heterosexual marriage have more sex and have better sex. But Satan wants us to believe that we'll have more enjoyment when we do things contra God's design. Instead, actually what happens is we break the design and order that God instituted for the world and we lose out on pleasure and actually we gain a whole lot of negative consequences as well. I'll give you a couple examples. Think of HIV. Think of any sexually transmitted disease. Think of fatherlessness. Think of the broken marriages. None of this would exist if we were obeying God's design and rule. Think of the kids that bounce back and forth between mom's house and baby daddy's house every weekend. None of that would take place if we were obeying God's design and will. The brokenness that we see... Yet stuff we're probably paying counselors to help us through. None of this stuff would be going on if we were obeying God's will. He's for our joy. He's for our pleasure. But he's created some designs for this. God's for sexual enjoyment. He's, and he's giving us a description of how it's meant to work. So this is why Lot comes to them. And he says to them in verse 7, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. And listen to how they respond. Take a look at verse 9. They said, stand back. Then this fellow came to sojourn. He's become our judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. They pressed hard against the man lot, and they drew near to the door to break it back down. How dare you tell us how to live? You're imposing your values and your morality on us. That's oppressive. You're not even a citizen of here. Now that he was a citizen, now they're calling him, you sojourned here and now you're going to become judge of us? You're trying to insert your culture over ours. That's oppressive. 
And if you disagree with our, our judgments, we're going to harm you. Does that sound familiar? I think the first case of cancel culture right here in the Bible. You disagree with us, that's a hate crime, and so we have a justification to hate you and try to kill you. Same things going on today. You're imposing your values, your morality on us, and that's immoral. In the midst of a, the culture we live in that's done away with this idea that there's a creator who who's has laws, we've instead bought into a, a, a wacky lie that somehow we evolved from goo. And right and wrong, therefore, are just societal constructs, things that we've made up to make society function, but they're not right or wrong. And no one has any right to call anything right or wrong. That's the argument of our culture. But we didn't evolve from goo. In case in point, I'll give you an example. If we evolved from goo and weren't actually created male and female as God said, how did we get here? If we evolved from some fish that climbed out of the cosmic goo, we would have needed another compatible fish to climb out of the goo at the same time, at the same point in that evolutionary process in order to be able to procreate and move forward. You need a matching male and female evolutionary advance at the same time at every step along the way. Evolution doesn't have a provision for reproduction. The Bible does, though. It says, in the beginning, God created us male and female. God made us male and female genitalia that work together to be able to reproduce. And it's through men and women having sex according to God's design that reproduction is possible. When we move away from this idea to have sex with women and women and men and men, this isn't evolution as being claimed. This is devolution. And you look at the outcome of what will come from it. It's not the furtherance of the species, but the end of it. There is a creator. Everything points to it. We're here because there is male and female, and male, male and female come together to produce um, and procreate. This is clear, and therefore we ought to look to this creator for instructions on how our sex operates. We're going we're gonna to see here that God comes and judges Sodom because of the rejection of his design and order. Because they knew God's design would be the argument, as we all do. Logic, the logic of everything points to this. God's created order speaks to this. His law reveals it. Therefore, no one can say, I don't know. Revelation, uh, sorry, Romans speaks to this. It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. All of it. So not just this or that. It's all unrighteousness. When we wave our middle finger to the air and tell God we're going to do whatever we want in our proud actions, all of that unrighteousness, God's wrath will be revealed. Why? Because in our unrighteousness, we suppress the truth. We suppress this idea that there's a God who has a right to rule and judge his creation. Romans says, what can be known about God is plain to them. God has shown it to them, but bold and willfully, they don't tremble as they blaspheme. The problem isn't that we don't know or that it can't be known or truth can't be found. The problem is the truth is embedded in our souls and our minds. The very fabric of the universe testifies to it, but you and I are prone to suppress it. Like if you've ever been to the pool, you hold that ball underwater, that's what we're doing. We're working to suppress the truth of God so that we can do whatever the heck we want. But Romans goes on to say, Although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So when we do this, we sear our conscience. We begin to forget. We claim to be wise, but we become fools. And notice this line. We exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. When we cease to say, yes, in the beginning, God created... We were made in the image of God, male and female. When we do away with that idea, where do we get? You and I have evolved from creeping things. We lose our image bearer status. We're doing this today. When we give up the idea that we were created by a creator, 
We exchange a glorious truth for a much lesser idea. And we descend into chaos. Things don't work as God intended. Romans goes on and says, Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to, no, to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Have we not arrived here culturally? Giving approval to everything. We celebrate it. This is what's going on in Sodom. It's the same exact thing. Bold and willfully, God's law has been ignored. So Lot comes and pleads with them, but they're having none of it. So Lot does something else. And, and this is a troubling text. I'm, I'm dealing with this just because I know there's probably some questions. He takes his daughters. Take a look at, uh, at verse 7. He says, I beg you, don't act wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who haven't known any men. Let me bring them out. Do with them as you please. Only do nothing to these men. Now, this is troubling. When we read this, this can you know, probably raise some questions. We need to uh, remember here, um, this is not being presented as a good or an honorable or a right or a moral thing. It's not. Lot is not righteous in this action. This is a wicked deed, which reminds us that the Bible isn't full of stories of good guys and bad guys, but bad guys who get rescued by the grace of God. That's the story of Abram. It's a pagan worshiper, and it's the story of Lot. Lot, God comes and takes Lot and drags him out of the city. Actually, in one verse here, um, when he asks to go into Zohar, when he's released, God says, I'll grant you this favor also, which alludes to the fact that him being rescued from the city at all was a favor, not anything he earned. What I think Lot's doing here is perhaps dismissing one sin because it appears less grievous than another. And so he comes and he's like, well, rather than you come and engage in this homosexual activity with these two, which is with these men, which is a clear deviation of God's revealed will, it'd be better for you to have sex with my daughters because that's more natural. But it's still sin. We need to see this. It's still sin. It's like he's dismissing one sin because it appears less grievous than another. And we, I think, do all this as well. You know, we go, you know, sure, I shouldn't be looking at this on my phone, but at least I'm not having an affair. Sure, um, I shouldn't be doing this, but at least I'm not like that guy. My sin pales in comparison to theirs. I think this is what's going on with Lot. He's measuring himself off the culture. He's not measuring his sin off of God's law or this action based off of God's law. He's measuring it off of the culture. And this is a dangerous place to get to, but I think we do it all the time as well as Christians in the middle of what is the equivalent of Sodom today. And to use an analogy, anyone in the construction industry? A couple in this one. Okay, so when you start a new construction site, you put a post in the corner, you bring in the surveyors, they set one point and everything gets built off of this one Point. It's a control point. It's um, sometimes referred to as the cornerstone. Then you'll lay grid lines out and everything gets built off of one point because if you built one wall off of that point and they did all your measurements off that wall and then measurements off of that wall, eventually you'd have this big wonky building. It would turn into a giant mess. You, you need one control point. Nothing would be plumb otherwise. Likewise, when we measure our morality off a culture that has deviated off of the plumb line of God's truth, and go, I'm straight according to them. We're not straight at all. We're just as crooked. We need to measure ourselves off of God's revealed will, not the culture around us. I think that's the error that he's falling into here. This is how you end up like Sodom or Canada in 2023. So, law, clearly a sinner, and so it says that 
the angels come and they command him to leave the city. Tell him to leave, tell him to get a son's in law, but he doesn't go. If you take a look at verse 15, they've come and warned him the night before, and then verse 15 says, Morning dawns. Apparently, a whole night's gone by. Morning dawns. The angels come to Lot and say, Take your wife, your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Now, verse 16, but he lingered. He sticks around. He doesn't want to head out of town. He has a hatred for Sodom on one hand, but he also has an affinity for it on the other. And I think it's in his, his wife. It's in his sons-in-law who don't want to leave town. And I think it's in his daughters as well. This, this love of Sodom. God comes and, and commands him out and he's about to destroy it. Two things I think worth mentioning here. One, that Sodom isn't destroyed before they've already received grace. Before they've already received a warning. On chapter 8, um, pardon me, much earlier, chapter 14, Abe came and rescued Sodom from captivity and some foreign gods. God's shown grace. They've been reminded that there's a God. Secondly, um, Lot came and warned them, don't do these wicked things. He warned his sons-in-law, judgment's coming. They're destroyed, but they were forewarned. Second thing worth noting about God destroying this is that they were, God was also ready to show mercy. Had there been 10 righteous people in the city, he said he would have saved the whole thing. But as it is, only four were pulled out and three came to safety. God judges, but God is ready to show mercy here. And that is evidenced in the fact that Lot is dragged out of town. It says in verse 18, when I find it, Lot said to them, oh, don't, don't take me out. If you, but don't make me go to the hills as he's dragged out. If I found favor in your sight, show another kindness to me. Let me, let me go to this city nearby. I think he's, he's got this affinity for this culture and he doesn't want to leave it. God calls him and he's pulled back. And he, he negotiates here in verse 30, permission, or pardon me, in verse 20, permission to just move to a different city. And then what we see is um, there's still a problem though. He, he leaves the city, but there's still a problem. Take a look at verse 30. Lot went up out of Zor. He moves into the mountains with two daughters uh, for he's afraid to live in Zor. So he goes and he lives in a cave. So we've seen this. He negotiates to leave. He goes to the city. Apparently that's not good enough. So he goes up into the mountains and the same sort of thing that's going on in Sodom suddenly begins to repeat. His daughters come and, and impregnate him. Or impregnate him, pardon me. They become impregnated by him. Pardon me, that was awkward. You're listening? Good. Okay, yeah, thank you. You're with me. Some here, I, 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 I think that there's something going on. What we're seeing is, is Lot loving the city, not wanting to leave. His son-in-law is loving the city, not wanting to leave. His wife looking back, being turned into a pillar of salt. Him going up into the mountains, his daughters getting him blackout drunk and having a Jerry Springer show episode. This is all pointing to the fact that you can leave Sodom and Sodom can still be in you. And our solution, yes, is not to become syncretized by the culture. That's a danger. But if we go and like become sectarians and live in the woods, the same exact thing can be going on. Because our problem is actually what's going on in our hearts a lot of the time. What our heart desires. His daughters say, you know, let's get dad pregnant because there's no man on the face of the whole earth, which is just a complete Complete lie. There's lots of men. Actually, they're back in the promised land God had given you that you guys left. You have to wait a minute. Their hearts pulled towards wickedness. They want to go back to this city. And, and 
this kind of brings up, cracks open a theme that we see all throughout the scriptures is God takes his people out from a place, but there's something in our hearts that longs to go back. God comes and takes his people out of Egypt, but there's something in their hearts that longs to go back. This is what I think this, this story has been preserved for us for, is, to, is a warning to us because you and I, we live in Sodom as well. We live in a perverse culture and we're at risk like Sodom Um, pardon me, like those who dwelled in Sodom, like Lot's son-in-laws, to be in love with the place, to grow numb to the sins of the culture around us and actually miss the call of God to come out from it. And when we do, we we stand in the same place as those who are going to receive the judgment of God. I can't help um, but think of Revelation 18. I actually want to invite you to just turn there with me in your Bibles. Revelation 18, I think, is the New Testament equivalent of God calling Lot out of Sodom. If you flip there, what you'll see this is an angel comes and says to John this, fallen is Babylon the great. I want to unpack this image for just a sec. If you remember, the very first city we saw in the Bible was Babylon. Babylon, where people, instead of scattering across the face of the old earth, had come together. They're acting in violation and, and, and rebellion against God's revealed will. This, is, this picture of cities in the Bible continues through. Cities are, in a sense, a metaphor for rebellion against God. It doesn't mean God doesn't love cities, that we shouldn't live in them. But often what you see in cities is people in revolt against God's will. So here it says, fallen is Babylon the great. This is what it means. God's saying, one day, this city of rebellion, this spiritual picture over the earth, it's all going to fall. It's all going to fall. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. The kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. This is our world. Then it says this, John says, I heard another voice saying this, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. Lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God will remember her iniquities and pay her back. Come out of her, my people. This is the call to us. We, like Lot, dwell in the midst of Sodom, a culture that's living in rebellion against God. We, like Lot, might have grown numb to some of the sins around us. We've begun to tolerate them, and we need to see what it is. There is sin at work in our culture that's radically intolerable toward God, and we need to not be tangled up into it. We need to not buy into these lies. As you read on in Revelation 18, what you'll see is that there's a description here of those who are tangled up, merchants who begin to grieve as the city is destroyed because everything they delighted in is still in that city. It says the merchants gained wealth from her. Who gained wealth from her will stand far off when she's destroyed, weeping and mourning aloud because all their wealth is weighed or laid to waste. The call of God's people is to be a people whose treasure is set in heaven, not here on earth, so that when uh, judgment comes against our wicked culture, which it is going to, we are a people who are found with our hope secured in heaven. We are a people whose hearts are, are not lulled to sleep with the siren songs of Babylon. It's a tough text, but I I want to close this with two questions here. One, are we entangled in Babylon? Are we entangled in Babylon? Better question for us is where are we entangled in Babylon? Because we live in the midst of this picture of Babylon and Sodom. Where are we entangled? Where are we like the shipmasters in Revelation 18 who grieve the loss of the city because our hope's secured and found in it? Are we citizens of this city Or are we citizens of heaven first? Jesus here calls his people to come out and not look back. Second question I want to ask us as we close now is where have our hearts grown numb to the things that God hates? Where have our hearts, like maybe Lot's sons-in-law, just grown to accept the culture around us, the perversion of it, and, and maybe even we're calling that acceptable or normal. Where have we grown numb? 
I want to invite us to stand, Praxis. And I want, to, I want to call us to be a people who set our hope and delight principally on Jesus and his coming kingdom. I want to call us to loosen our grip on this world so we don't miss the call to come out. And as we transition into a time of um, response now, I want to just ask us all, before we come and take communion, to honestly ask the Spirit to search our hearts, show us where where perhaps we become entangled in the business of Babylon or where our hearts have grown numb to some of the things around us and invite the Spirit to come and revive our hearts, come awaken our hearts, renew our thinking, free us from whatever cultural delusion we might have bought into. I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for tough words. And I believe that tough words can soften our hearts. That's your intention behind it. It's not for it to harden us, but to soften us. And so we pray, would you come and Holy Spirit just reveal where we've, we've become like the citizens of Sodom, celebrating things that are contrary to your will. Maybe engaging in things that are contrary to your will. As we come, I trust that there is a grace after grace for all who lay behind their ways and come out of this, this city that exalts itself against you and your will. I pray as we come and respond now, Jesus, your grace would come and manifest itself in a greater way in all our hearts and minds. We pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to have some couples serving communion. And um, if you're here and you're Christian, this is something we do weekly to just celebrate and remember that, hey, no one's hands are clean. No one here is righteous and unrighteous. We're, we're all unrighteous, just like Lot. Our only hope is Jesus comes and drags us out like he did to Lot. And we believe that there is salvation here in Christ. Anyone who wants to turn and come out from this perversion of this culture and all, that exalts itself against God, there is a way. It's in Christ. And so if you're here and you're a Christian, come forward and take this and celebrate because your sins are taken care of. If you're here and you're not a Christian today, I just want to encourage you to take Christ. There is a way made through Christ to exit all of this mess and to come into a new relationship with God, to come and live life in the way it was intended to. And so the invitation to all today is to come and receive Christ. If you're here and a Christian, come and do that through um, taking the elements. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I just want to say, stay in your seats and take Christ today. Come when you're ready.